This is the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where it's all about getting the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. Brought to you by Inamur Shafir, founder and CEO of Umbrella, the technology platform and brand that is powering thousands of marketing agencies around the country. Find him at UmbrellaUS.com. And now, here's your host, Inamar Shafir. Welcome to the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where we talk with successful marketing experts about ways to build and grow a digital marketing agents. My guest today is an internationally recognized consultant, speaker, blogger, author, mentor, coach, and a serial entrepreneur. He had five multi-million dollar businesses before the age of 30. His best-selling book, The Introvert's Edge, has been endorsed by Harvard and Princeton, to name a few. He's the founder and CEO of Rapid Growth LLC, dedicated to achieving maximum ROI for businesses of all sizes, which is very relevant for you guys listening. I'm excited to say hello to Mr. Matthew Pollard. Hi, Matthew. G'day, mate. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, thank you for joining us. You know, uh, before we get started helping the listeners grow their business, which is something you do very, very well, maybe we can uh, learn a little bit about your story, how you got into you know, making five uh, multi-million dollar businesses and then after how you got into helping other businesses grow as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, what's really interesting, I mean, I think a lot of people when they hear that kind of bio, they go, oh, this guy must just have the gift of gab. He must just have this natural ability. He must have hit the ground running and just known what he wanted to be his entire life. And so it's really important for people to understand that it's actually not the case. I mean, when I was in late high school, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I was super introverted. I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And luckily enough, I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome when I was about 16. And basically what it means is I put on this funny pair of colored lenses and miraculously I can learn to read. The problem is I couldn't learn to read like everyone else. I had to start the process of learning to read. So, I mean, high school was tough for me. I hustled every day. I, I got into the top 20% of my state. My family could all see that, I mean, I was exhausted. I had no idea where I was gonna go. You know, the, the funny colored lenses, the bad acne I had back then really had hit my confidence pretty well. And so we all agreed I was just gonna spend a year finding myself. And literally I took a job at a real estate agency and within the first few weeks, I found out I'd lost my job because they were gonna shut down the business um, over Christmas and then they weren't gonna reopen. And I'm like, Australia at Christmas is like, everyone takes a month off, right? They're closed for summer holidays, they're closed for um, Christmas, they're just, they're shut. People go off on the 20th of December, they don't come back till the 15th or 20th of January. And here I am out of work. And I mean, I come from a family, I wasn't exactly going to travel Europe or sit on the couch and watch Oprah, but my dad broke his back 80 hours a week supporting the family, I had to work. So I remember being terrified about telling my dad I was, I was out of work only a couple of weeks in. So I remember going to the, the news agency, picking up the classifieds back then and seeing three jobs. That was the only three jobs that were, um, that were on offer at that time because everyone was closing down. Who's going to want to hire before they go on a month long break? The three jobs were all these things called commission only sales roles. <laughs> and I remember going, oh my gosh, that, that's daunting. But I applied for all three jobs and I got three interviews. And then I got three job offers and I'm like, well, maybe they see something in me I don't see in myself. So I took one selling B2B telecommunications and my manager, he, he put my, my excitement, my, my confidence to, well, he killed it pretty quickly. He said, Matt, we just hire everyone. We throw mud up against the wall and we see what sticks, which is a fun saying until you realize you're the mud. So <laughs> after you know, five days product training and not a single second of sales training, I get thrown on this road. It's called Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia. And I get, get told to go sell. Well, I mean, I don't know how to sell. I, I didn't even know what to say. I knew about the product, that's it. So I took this deep breath and I, I walked into the first door and luckily now that I look back on it, I was politely told to leave because the next door I was sworn at, the next door I was told to get a real job, which was always my personal favorite. It was the only job I could get. And that just kept happening door after door until I made my first sale, which was actually my 93rd door. I got 92 no's this, that day before I got my first yes. And I remember I walked out ecstatic for about 45 seconds until I got told, you know, until I had this other realization, I got to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next. And I went, you know what? This isn't okay, but I can't quit. But I'm not willing to accept that hustle grinding it out mentality that a lot of people do. I mean, that would be 106 doors the next day or 45 and then back to 150. I just, I wasn't willing to accept that. Mm -hmm. So I remember saying, well, if sales is going to work for me, it has to be as a, as a system because I'm super introverted. I, I need to follow a regimented process. I don't have that gift of gab. 
So I went thinking, how am I going to learn this process? And literally I went, well, you know what? Um, I can't read books because my reading speed's too slow. It would have taken me a year to read them, let alone apply them. But that was about when YouTube was becoming popular. So I typed in sales system into YouTube and all these videos came up. And day after day, I mean, I'd spend eight hours practicing that night. The next morning I'd go out and work in the field for eight hours, you know, putting to, to work what I'd learned. Weekends I'd spend 16 hours practicing back on Monday to do the same thing all over again. But day after day, I'd get better. Soon it was like 65 doors, then it was 43, then it was 21, then it was 19, then it was eight, then it was three. Every day I got better. And I remember it was about six weeks in, my manager pulls me aside and I thought I'd done something wrong because I mean, I was the quiet guy that handed my paperwork in downstairs and then listened to all the boisterous sales reps talk about how bad the market had got and how tough commission only sales was. And he, he just looked puzzled and he said, Matt, we've, we just got our national sales figures, which only came out once a month at that point. And it turns out you're the number one salesperson in the company, which just happened to be nice. the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So I'd gone from, I mean, really terrified to sell, having no business at it, to being the number one in the company in less than six weeks. Well, shortly after that, I got promoted. And I don't know why people think, because you can sell, you can manage. I was a terrible manager. I got given a team of 20 people, mud up against the wall, they all quit. But I went back to YouTube, learned how to manage, and then I got better at that as well. I got promoted seven times in 12 months and then went out a year later to start my own business. And yeah, long story short, responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. And now, you know, my books, The Introvert's Edge, uh, have now sold almost 100,000 copies between the two of them. Uh, the second one launched just uh, in January last year. So it's been an exciting journey, but my real passion is around helping introverts like me realize they're not second class citizens. Their path to success is just different because once you develop a regimented process for sales, for networking, it's not like you can survive in sales in an extroverted sales world. You can dominate, you actually have the edge. And my personal belief is any introvert can outsell or out network any extrovert, their, well, their extroverted counterparts, if you like, but only mm. if they have a planned and prepared system that they're not winging things every time they try. Okay, so I, it's an amazing story and I guess we have a lot of introverts listening to us right now. I, I think actually, and I will include myself in those, I think uh, we're the majority. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I mean, people think of digital marketing and they think of the hardcore salesperson trying to pitch digital marketing, which we get those spam messages on LinkedIn every day and, and those sorts of things. And people go, oh, they must be extroverted. But every digital marketer that I speak to, probably because they hear my, about my books and they come over to me because of that, but they're like, it's a highly technical expertise. And even extroverts struggle to talk about the complexities of the industry without complicating things, which right. makes them come across as, you know, um, the, well, the complex sale just makes them come across as shy or, you know, um, quietly spoken because they're overwhelmed with how much information they've got to share. And truthfully, they don't need to share all that information. They've got to tell stories. They've got to follow. I mean, the customer doesn't care. They don't want to be downloaded a lifetime of experience in a 30 minute meeting, but no one knows how to do it differently, which tends to make people hide behind emails trying to sell to people or leads okay. to these case study sales pitches, which mean bulldog sales techniques at the end where people are so worried about the budget, which makes any even extrovert feel uncomfortable because they're selling themselves. But truthfully, right. introverts, it makes us want to jump out of the industry. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, so maybe you can give us a couple of examples of how you help introverts. Let's say an introvert marketing agency owner, a small one that also needs to do sales himself, right? The owner makes the sales. Uh, how does, you know, what kind of tips, what kind of processes he can, uh, he can, he can introduce to, for himself or herself to, to get better at sales? Absolutely. Well, the first thing is there's a lot you can do before you even get to sales. I mean, one of the things that I tell people all the time is sales is a systematic process. Like literally, I mean, people don't have to buy my book, by the way. If you go to the introvertsedge.com, you'll be able to download the first chapter of my book and literally it outlines the first seven steps. Well, the full seven steps. Now, firstly, I'll get you over the belief that you can sell as an introvert and realize you actually have an advantage. And then I'll give you those seven steps. What I find is what happens is introverts have this really awkward conversation at the start where they're trying to build rapport, but they're terrible at it. So it doesn't <laughs> go so well. And then the customer starts you know, probing about what the price is or what the product's going to be. And then they do this awkward conversation where they talk about features and their packages, and then they get to the price. And of course that's going to go poorly, right? They yeah. have to really want to buy to buy with that sort of sales pitch. Well, what I help people realize is that sales is a series of steps where it can all be planned, it can all be prepared. And if you include stories rather than jargon and ask the right questions, not just questions for the sake of questions, 
you really can lead the customer in a natural step-by-step -step process that leads to a sale. And I outlined the seven steps and literally everyone listening, if you just download that seven step process, you can grab what you currently say and put it in under those seven steps. You'll realize some things pretty quickly. There's some things out of order, fix that. Secondly, you'll realize there's some things that don't fit. Stop saying that to customers, throw that stuff out. And then you'll realize that there's some gaping holes, usually around asking the right questions and telling great stories. If you fix that, you literally will double your sales in the next 60 days. However, the problem is more often than not, the reason why most agencies struggle to get clients is yes, they're terrible at sales, but they're also not getting enough leads. And the reason why they're not getting enough leads is they go to a networking room and somebody says, oh, what is it you do? And you're like, oh, I'm a digital agency. Oh no, I work for the digital agency. It didn't work for me. Shut down straight away. Or, oh, I need that. How much do you cost? And now that we're talking about price, we've just met each other, right? Yeah. It's a horrible situation. Try saying you're a sales trainer. It doesn't go any better. So <laughs> instead, what you need to do is learn how to sidestep the battle. And actually, I, I'll give you an example. I actually, I worked with a language tutor years ago. And this language tutor, I mean, she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And for like a decade, she charged 50 to $80 an hour for private consultation. And she did it successfully. The problem was there were more and more people moving into California willing to charge 30 to $40 an hour to start their own businesses. Very mm -hmm. similar to the digital agencies. On top of that, there are also people in China offering to do it for $12 an hour on Craigslist and free technology out of uh, Silicon Valley where you could match up with someone and I'll teach you English, you teach me Mandarin, we just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So hugely commoditized industry with the lowest commodity being free, not a great industry for her to be in. So she comes to me and she says, Matt, can you teach me some sales techniques to close more deals? And I'm like, well, sure I can, but it's all, if people are seeing you as a commodity up front, you've already lost. What we need to do is learn how to sidestep the battle altogether. So what I did is I went through all the clients that she'd worked with over the years. And I mean, gosh, there were hundreds of clients she'd worked with. But what I noticed is there were two clients specifically, she helped with just more than language tuition. These were executives being relocated to China. And I noticed that, I mean, she really helped them with, with three things. The first thing was the difference in rapport in China versus the Western world. Like, you know, in the Western world, if I'm trying to sell you something and I'm a really bad salesperson, at the end of a 45 minute awkward meeting, if I'm really bad at my job, I might say something horrible like, so do you want to move forward? And you'll say, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it, right? Yeah. Well, a week from now, if I reach out to you and you still say you want to think about it, I know my chances of getting that sale are almost gone. Well, in China, they're going to want to talk to you maybe five or six times before they even discuss business. They're probably going to want to see you drunk over karaoke once or twice. It's the kind of people that they are. But they're talking about 25, 50, 100 year deals, not transactional relationships like here. So she helped them understand that. She helped them understand the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world and the importance of respect while learning the language isn't enough. You have to reduce mm -hmm. your accent, how to handle a business card. I'm like, Wendy, stop. You're doing so much more for these people than just language tuition. What are you doing? And she's like, oh, there's just a few things. You know, I'm just trying to help. And I'm like, you're so stuck in your functional skill. And this is what I find happens with all the digital marketing world, especially because they spend so much time trying to re-educate themselves on the changes and the new things that are available. They get stuck in that jargon that they've just learned. They're trying to educate it to clients. I'm like, Wendy, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance you're giving these people, they're going to be more successful when they get to China? And she's mm -hmm. like, I mean, yeah, that's the point, right? I said, great. Let's call you the China success coach then. Forget about Mandarin education for a second. Let's focus on creating what we call the China Success Intensive, which worked out to be a five week program for the executive, the spouse and any children being relocated to China. Hmm. Now, she loved the idea of this, but she's like, well, who do I sell it to? Yeah. Now, think about what we've just done. The first thing we did is we got the message right. Now she's asking, who should I niche down to? Who should I sell it to, right? Now, mm -hmm. I said to her, well, who do you think you should sell it to? And she said, well, obviously executives, right? Basically everybody. I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about that. And, you know, while I was terrified moving from Australia to the United States, I just don't think it's your ideal client, even, even though, you know, they're probably terrified about speaking a totally different language. I just don't think it's your client. And she's like, well, obviously the companies would pay. Again, every company that can afford it. Still not very niche, right? It's like people say, oh, I've niched down. I'm only working with small business. Sure, that's a niche. So... <laughs> The problem is, I said, that's still broad. It's not going to help you. And I said, again, while they probably have millions of dollars riding on the executive being successful, I still don't feel like it's your right fit. She's mm -hmm. frustrated now. She's like, well, who then? And I said, well, I personally think your ideal client's the immigration attorney. She looked at me like I'm speaking a different language myself. And I said, think about it. These people make five to $7,000. 
for doing all the paperwork, the bureaucracy that comes with getting the visa. They've got to get the customer, which we all know is not cheap or free. Um, plus, they've got to have staff, they've got office space. I said, I would go to networking events where immigration attorneys hang out. And I said, they'd be lucky to make $3,000 for doing the visa. I said, offer them $3,000 for a simple introduction. They love the idea. They're like, double my profit for a simple introduction. What have I got to say? And all she yep. said is, you just got to say, congratulations, you've now got your visa. I just want to double check you're ready, ready to go to China. And the executive would always say something like, yeah, I think we're good. We've got our place now. We're learning the language. Our kids are getting pretty good at it too. We've got our visa. Thank you. I think we're set. And they just respond with, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. So Wendy now networks with people that are ecstatic to make more money. And then when she gets on the phone with the executive that's being relocated or their organization, she gets on the phone with the easiest sell in the world. Now she charged $30,000 for this five week program. Minus yeah. the $3,000 referral, she made 27,000 for the easiest sale in the world. That's rapid growth. And that's the power of what I call having a differentiated and unified message. You've got to get beyond your functional skill. And you've got to say, what are the things I do outside the scope of my functional skill? either completely unique or unique because of my own experiences, my own background, my own past customers, whatever it is, everyone's got a unique formula that they all have that perfectly qualify them to help a demographic of people. And then how do I message that? What's the higher level benefit? For Wendy, it was China success. So she became the China success coach. For me, you know, I'm a branding expert, I'm a marketing specialist, I'm a social media strategist. In truth, I'm too many things and nobody cares. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy and I work exclusively with introverted service providers to obtain rapid growth, the simplicity of that message breaks through that crowd of market. It breaks beyond the noise and creates a rapid growth business. Attach that uh, to even the basic sales process, you get success. Okay, so th that's amazing advice. And it goes to basically building a brand for yourself and being unique in the market. But, you know, you're very talented. You don't, you know, I... I I'll give you credit for what you just said. Uh, you got enough credit, but it's it's a very smart positioning, and it's different when you look at a person than when you're trying to you know when you're trying to change something in yourself. You don't have that view from the outside. How would you recommend a person? Like, what would be the one, two, threes to to, to take yourself out of yourself, look at yourself with a you know clear set of eyes, not being stuck in, in your in in the same uh, kind of uh, trenches that you've always been and and come 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 up with this idea which is it's a very smart idea i don't think like people could just do oh yeah okay now i'm a marketer now i'm i don't know the fairy of uh whatever hvac <laughs> well, companies i wouldn't use the word fairy personally but um you know there oh, yeah, are some well, people that have called themselves Actually, the word fairy has been used and, and, and it's worked successfully. So um, I, first thing is I would say nothing's out of bounds, but here's what I will tell you. It took me nearly two and a half, three months to come up with my own unified message as the rapid growth guy. Meanwhile, I will tell you that was trial and error of first working out that by introducing myself as a salesperson, they looked at me like I was one step above a scam artist because they'd had a bad experience in the past. And then when I introduced myself as a marketer, people just go, oh, I need that. How much do you cost? Or they were dismissive. So I had to first learn how to introduce myself differently. You know, I talk about, you know, in my new book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking, I talk about the evolution of how I came up with the idea of the unified message, which is mm -hmm. what the China Success Coach is. But, you know, it took me two months, three months to come up with my own. It takes me about two to three hours to come up with somebody else's. I will say on, it is a rarity where somebody hears this advice and goes, oh, I know exactly what to call myself. It takes time. What I would recommend is this. Firstly, you should buddy up with somebody else. If they haven't listened to this podcast, get them to listen to this podcast first so that they understand the concept and why. Ideally, it's somebody that's not in the digital marketing space so that you guys don't know each other's jargon. Maybe they're a florist and you're a digital agency, or maybe they're a lawyer and you're a digital agency. But because of that, they're not going to buy into your jargon. It either makes sense and it works or it doesn't. Right, So it's so important to find someone external to your industry to listen to it. And I know that this podcast predominantly services you know, the people from the, the digital world, but the truth is any of your friends will get value from this interview if they're a small business owner, and then they can help you come up with your unified message. Now, once you've done that and they've listened to the podcast, I would recommend this, that you set aside about three hours, about an hour and a half for you to work with them on helping them come up with their unified message in their niche, and then you swap over. Again, having someone from an outside industry, about an hour and a half is really all it takes because, 
you know, it, it, they see things that you don't, right? Just like the China Success Coach, I was able to go out and go, here are the things that you're doing for this unique group of people. And that made all the difference. Now, you are going to need a template. Um, you know, I, I go through a, a series of five questions. And, you know, I did this at the National Freelance Conference. And I literally said, you know, at the end of this session, you know, put your hand up if you now have a unified message that you believe will excite and inspire people to want to know more, your version of the China Success Coach. And you've identified a niche of willing and wanting to buy clients, people that will pay you what you're worth. Like 97% of the room put their hands up, which sounds amazing until I tell you the whole session was 90 minutes long. I mean, that I literally asked people, I said, keep your hands up if this is the most time you spent actively working on your marketing since you started your right. business. Now. Right. now I use the word actively because truthfully, most people aren't actively working on their businesses. They are reading books, which is to, in my mind, if they just read, I mean, people say I've read a hundred books this year. Well, that to me is busy procrastination because how many of you applied? That's what really matters. So the, what I would suggest is that 90 minute session, I mean, I had a florist that came back to me two months later and said she doubled her business from that session. Right. If a florist can do it, anyone here listening that got a bit of a marketing background, especially in the world of digital, we all do. You definitely can. What you need to do, though, is go to the uh, sorry, you need to go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. You can download the template there for free and then buddy up with someone to go through those five questions. Again, you don't need to hire me for this, but you do need to block out the time and find a buddy to do it with. If you do that, you will get the same outcome. It's an excellent advice. Excellent. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, uh, emotional intelligence. You wrote about it recently. Um, I think that a lot of marketers, at least in my experience, have a high emotional intelligence, even if they're not, uh, even if they're not sure what it is. Uh, but it, it's kind of required in the creative profession. Um, uh, can you, can you talk about this and, and how, how, how can it help you develop it more and more? This podcast is brought to you by Umbrella. Have an agency? Check out UmbrellaUS.com to grow it today. Yeah, so I, I think that one of the things that introverts have, and as you highlighted, most people in the digital world tend to have, tend to be more introverted, right? So you might say that extroverts perhaps aren't the best listeners. Um, they're not the most empathetic. However, introverts tend to be, right? They tend to be really empathetic. They tend to be great listeners. And because of that, they tend to have a higher level of emotional intelligence than their extroverted counterparts, which is mm. why I say that introverts can outsell and outnetwork their extroverted counterparts. Now, that's not to say that extroverts can't learn these skills, but they need to go and get coaching, right? So there are books like um, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, where you can learn how to develop your emotional intelligence. And I think it's really important to, to understand that for the average extrovert though, the difference is that if they work for an organization that recognizes these deficits, they'll send them to emotional intelligence classes. Where for an introvert that can't sell, they go, oh, poor Matt can't sell, he's an introvert. We just, you know, there's no helping him. So right. the good news is for anyone that's lacking emotional intelligence as an extrovert, right? You know, you don't have that barrier to get past where you don't believe that it's possible for you. You can just go and learn you know, how to be better at emotional intelligence. But yeah, I mean, understanding empathy, self-regulation, right, controlling your emotions, these are really important skill sets. Reflection, I mean, the number of times I felt anxious in my life about certain um, activities, um, possible opportunities, and I'm like, why am I anxious about going down this path? And I realized that the goal isn't, in the, sorry, the, the objective, even though it's exciting, even though it makes a lot of money, isn't aligned with my goals and what I'm passionate about. Yeah. So understanding that sense of yourself, you know, I actually was just on a podcast just before this, it was a goal setting podcast. And he said, you know, what's your one tidbit about, you know, successful goal setting? And I said, the first thing is don't set audacious goals until you've built self efficacy on short term, small goals. Because mm -hmm. truthfully, if you don't believe you can get there, like if you set this audacious goal, you're just going to avoid it until what December, and then you'll realize, oh, I haven't hit that one, we'll set the goals again in January, it never happens. So I suggest that the first thing is really getting a sense of who you are. And the way to do that is to set three business goals, three personal goals, one that's selfish to yourself, because that'll be the one that drives you. I explain this in detail in a uh, Better Business Coach is one of my other podcasts. I've got an Introvert's Edge podcast as well. But episode 17 is called Forget About Goals, Why is the Key to Success? And I get people to set three business goals, three selfish goals, and then I get them to summarize each one of those goals in 250 words or less, including why it's important to them. 
high achievers are really good at writing their goals. When it comes to writing the why, they're, oh my gosh. And they realize suddenly they have inherited that goal from their mother, their father, their, I don't know, drunk roommate they had in college. They hear these things like, that's what I want. I'm going to spend the rest of my life charging after it, but they don't really think it through, which is yep. why they feel really uncomfortable in sales. Cause it's like, Hey, I'd love to have you as a client because I'm just dying to buy a new Bentley, right? It doesn't come across as comfortable. So you have to create whys that have your passion and mission for changing the world or the impact that you want to have. That makes sales and networking so much easier. It allows you to be truly present and not feel uncomfortable in a sales or a networking activity. Now, especially for people in the digital marketing world that's highly technical, that lives in this world of constantly seeing you know, webinars about how to make your next million dollars, you need to yep. know what's truly important so you don't go and follow all the shiny objects, which digital marketers are absolutely prone to. So that exercise is gonna be really, really powerful for you. Once you know what you're passionate about, what mission you're on and what your goals are, then the skill set of self-regulation, i.e. just because it's a shiny object, I need to control myself. Or if there's a customer opportunity, but it's not one of my ideal clients, I know I'm going to hate working with them. So even though it's great money, I'm going to dedicate my time elsewhere, requires self, um, self-reflection. Now, on top of that, the other skills, now again, introverts have advantages on these, but extroverts can run circles around you with training. So introverts still need to hone these skills, learning how to empathize the right way and learning how to show empathy, not just empathize. Learning how to actively listen, but also show that you listened are really powerful skills. So it's really important, and you're right, I just wrote um, an article on this. So you know, if you go to matthewpollard.com and go to the blog post, there are strategies and steps on how to, um, how to really hone those abilities and work out what your strengths and your deficits are in regards to emotional intelligence. That's, uh, you know, that's so hard. That's so super hard and it's so needed. I went through the, the process myself uh twice <laughs> i think i got it wrong the first time even though I, I spent the time no because for you for yourself as a person and i agree it's key to everything that you do in life what is your passion like what what is it really uh and i i recommend anybody to do that i want to go back for a second into positioning and just touch on, on one point that i think is critical how do you go about product positioning so a personal positioning you can come and say, okay, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm the expert in this or, or I'm, the, I, I, I'm not the fairy of anything. And, uh, uh, but when it comes to products and then you, you want to talk about your products and, you know, I'm selling SEO, you're selling SEO, I'm selling Facebook advertising, he's selling Facebook advertising. How important is product positioning or is it all because they trust me, then they'll just buy my SEO? So there are two answers to that question because you have a widget and then you have a skill set that a person has, right? So your SEO or your pay-per-click advertising and things like that. So the thing you have to realize is SEO, pay-per-click advertising, all those sorts of things, they're just functional words, right? But you individually have a collection of experiences, past upbringings, um, past extra things that you've learned, whether it's from upbringing, from the clients that you've had, from the different certifications that you have. I mean, if you've read the book, The E-Myth, you don't go out and saying, I'm an e-myth specialist. It just becomes part of your experience, right? The problem is you spend so much time learning pay-per-click and you think that's all that you are. No, it's not. You've read tons of books. You've read, you, you've gone to school. You've had education. You've got perhaps bullied when you were younger. You had these things that happened that really made you better than everybody else with certain things. So what happens, just like the language coach that became the China success coach, you're introducing yourself as the language tutor because you do SEO. You talk about the different frameworks that you use to teach it because those are the frameworks you learn. That's the same as talking about the functional skills of what you do in the digital marketing world. You have to stop Mm. doing that. You become the unified message. I worked with a a digital marketer who was, uh, look, I mean, she had four clients, luckily enough, that all paid her two and a half thousand dollars a year. And she'd had that for like a really long time. And then all of a sudden, two clients just stopped. And one, you know, one got bought out and they had a digital marketing service. The other one, you know, wasn't doing so well. And then another one stopped before we got to work together. And she's down to two and a half thousand dollars. And she's like, I'm now living in this gig economy where people don't want to commit to a two and a half thousand dollar subscription. They want me to sign up. uh, They want me to do individual projects. So now I've got a tender for every project. I'm always discounting it to get it. And then I've got a bill. It's a lot of extra work. So I started to look at the clients that she'd worked with. And what I realized 
is that she had this passion I couldn't really understand for the health tech industry. So mm -hmm. I asked her about it. She's like, I can't believe you saw that. Well, the reason why I have this passion is I had a pretty significant heart condition when I was younger. And without the, you know, the improvements in digital techno in, in technology, I wouldn't be alive today. I'm like, why are you not just working with these types of people? I said, help me understand. Would you, would you like die? Like, would it be amazing for you to just wake up every morning and help these people get their life-saving technology in front of their ideal clients? She's like, I mean, I, I would love that. I said, you come across as somebody that really understands marketing and loves researching people to re researching technology to really help clients. But if you focused on that industry, do you feel like you could be better at it than anyone else? She's like, well, yeah, I mean, if all, that's all I focused on. I said, great, yeah. let's call you the mission maven. Then what we'll do is we'll target digital agencies, we'll speak about your mission, and we'll focus on the fact that you hate that most digital agents, uh, that most organizations, they're writing copy, they're doing Facebook ads, they're doing all these things, and it's not working and they don't understand why. So you don't sell copywriting services and marketing, I get it, that's what you wanna sell eventually, but don't sell that right now. Go in and sell what we call a short-term intensive. This is what I call a Trojan horse package, where she went in and she sold, firstly, an assessment to help them work out who their avatar was. Secondly, auditing their content to help them realize that A, they weren't speaking to that avatar, they were speaking to their golf buddies about mm -hmm. what they'd created and all the features of the stuff that they did, or their you know, venture capitalist to raise money. They weren't writing to their avatar, which is why they had to spend money on Facebook ads because no one cared about that content. And you know what it's like with ads, as soon as you stop spending money, the yeah. deals stop coming in. So I said, we'll build out, audit their content to work out that there's an issue, then create a content tree of what they should be writing, then create a distribution plan for them. Then give them a scope of work, i.e. this is what you should do, and then an RFP, right? A, a framework of what they should be paying if they hire someone in-house, if they hire an external contractor. The first time she sold this, it was for three and a half thousand dollars. And before she even got through explaining the SOP, the client's like, well, can't you just help us with this? And she said, well, we, and we, of course, this was a script that we'd planned in advance. She said, well, normally um, we like to stay completely unbiased, but we do have a in-house group of marketers. And the reason we do that is so we can stay the best at what we do. And we just love what you do. We think it's an amazing product. So yes, we would love to work with you. However, the price for working with us exclusively is $10,000 a month. And the client said, sure, that's fine. <laughs> so now she's got her first $10,000 client. The second client didn't interrupt her, but at the end she said, now normally we don't do this. However, we love what you do into the same script. And the client said, sure, fine. Within the space of six months, she had four clients just like this. Now she's earning almost $40,000 a month. Again, niching down. That's all the skill sets by not defining them by the skill sets. Now, if you have a product, like a widget, you have to decide firstly, can I be the face of the brand for that product? And if you can, in truth, you're always going to get better success. But when I spoke at Electrolux, I helped them understand that they can have a high level branding and then a branding for each independent widget that they offer, whether it be washers, dryers, vacuum cleaners, whatever. But that requires a higher level strategy that you really have to think through because yeah. it's a very different type of offering. Yeah, so that's amazing, Matt. All these suggestions are detailed in your books. Like if somebody gets the book, you get the rundown of everything we're talking about and more. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, obviously you can get the first chapters of both books at theintrovertsedge.com or theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. But yeah, if you download the Kindle, the audio book or the print book, not only to get access to the book that breaks down all the strategies, the messaging stuff's all in the networking book because you can't network by introducing yourself by your functional skill. The sales strategies are obviously in, in the original Introvert's Edge. But in the back of every book, there's also a complete video training that's totally for free. As a matter of fact, wow. in the first book, it got listed by Global Gurus as the number three sales training in the world, and it's a free training. It's right next to a bunch of $5,000 sales trainings. I love it. So before I let you go, we have one more thing. It's a quick rapid Q&A, like a few seconds. Sure. I ask you quick questions, give me quick answers. If you feel, the questions are in no way edgy, but if you feel that one of them is not for you, just say pass, okay? Sounds good. Uh, did you get along with your parents growing up? I have a great relationship with my family. They were very supportive, especially with my reading issues. Do you have siblings? I do, an older sister. Do you have a pet? I do, he's a, a 10 pound little puppy. Do you have kids? Not right now. We actually what? just brand newly married, only about a year and a half. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so that answers if you're married. When do you wake up? 
I actually wake up late because I live in America and I have a lot of Australian clients as well. So I, I start late and work, uh, work late, but I actually get up at about nine. Oh, that's not too bad. When do you go to bed? Uh, about 1 a.m. Ideal vacation? Uh, look, I love traveling through Europe. I wouldn't want to live in Europe, but I love traveling through Europe. And are you a man of faith? I am. Excellent. Matt, you've been amazing. Guys, uh, go to MatthewPollard.com. A ton of excellent resources. Go to IntrovertsEdge.com for his books. Uh, he gives so much. And just from listening to you today, um, you're touching on, on all the pain points of people that I hear all the time. It's not people feel think so tactically that they forget that it's all strategic. At the end of the day, you need to go back, you need to do the work, and to do the work, you need the framework, and the framework is in your books. So I think it's a good idea to pick one. Uh, thank you. You've been amazing. It's my absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for tuning into another episode of the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where we provide the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. Your host has been Inamar Shafir, founder and CEO of Umbrella, the technology platform and brand that is powering thousands of marketing agencies around the country. Find him at UmbrellaUS.com.